and uh, it's the book of James, and I think Talk is Cheap is the best way to, to, to subtitle that book, if you will, just because James says, you know, you can talk about faith, you can talk about your relationship with God all you want, but if it's not showing up in your life, does it really matter? I mean, if God is that important to you, there should be changes in the way we live our lives. Because I am married to my beautiful wife, Deanna, I don't know why I had to say it that, except I should, because she's not even cooking lunch today, but she'll cook supper. My beautiful, lovely, talented wife, Deanna. Amen, that's right. If I say I love her, but yet I don't live with her in harmony, if I don't provide for my family, if I decide I can still date other women, man, that doesn't look much like love and understanding to her probably or to the world. It's the same with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to be in James in here a little bit, but I'm going to, I want to lay the, the groundwork a little bit by jumping back to Jeremiah chapter 2 here in just a minute. But before I do, let's have a word of prayer. Father, this morning, as we study your word, your word says, unless the Holy Spirit makes it alive, it's just going to be words. So I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, and you take your word and bury it deep into our lives, not just bury it, but it's used to bring about change in our thoughts and actions. In your name we pray, amen. <gasps> Hello, beautiful. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Hi, Anthony. How much does my discount double check save me? About 150. Done. I don't have State Farm, but insurance, find me money. I got you a dollar. Oh, you almost had it. You gotta be quicker than that. Having insurance isn't the same as having State Farm. There to help you with unexpected savings. That's getting to a better state. State Farm, right? That's an awesome commercial. My kids do it. Hunter does that all the time. Oh, you gotta be quicker than that. I don't know what that says about my son sounding like an 80-year-old man in waders, but he does it perfectly. <laughs> but but those two ladies in the commercial, what's the comparison? One lady knows her insurance company's name. It's State Farm. The other lady, I don't know who I have. So she's calling out to someone unknown. And she even knows, you know, the first lady the State Farm knows her agent's name, right? Anthony, how much did you save me? 500. Oh, <laughs> I got the purse, right? And the other lady, I, I, I don't know. And notice how the two treat each other as well. Here's the money you need. Here's the savings you needed to get the purse. Oh, here's a dollar for you. Well, a dollar ain't going to get her a purse. And then she can't even reach the dollar, right? It keeps getting dangled and, and pulled. Oh, we've got to be quicker than that. She's got she's to try and get to it. Those comparisons are kind of the way that some of us treat our relationship with God sometimes. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet was called by God to de deliver a message to Israel. Jeremiah is written during the time of the kings. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, God asked Jeremiah to deliver this message. He says, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of the harvest. God is saying, I remember how you loved me, Israel. I remember how you were even willing to follow me through the wilderness. In other words, where there's no water, where there's no trees, where there's no signs of life, you followed me, and times were good. And God, as we know, eventually led them out of the desert to a place that they inherited cities they didn't build, food they didn't have to plant. God was good. Their relationship was amazing. But notice something changed. Notice Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? God says, after all we've been through, all those hard times, yes, but I always provided, all the good times where you didn't have to do anything and there was city and there was spoils and there was food and there was water, after all of those things, why did you leave? Why did you turn around? <coughs> and he says, after worthless things. You know, the whole part of that State Farm commercial is to understand how much State Farm cares about their customers, right? 
It, the whole part is to understand that State Farm is there for you when, you need you, when you're going to need them. But these other insurance companies that you don't even know the name of, they say they'll be there. But to even get anything, you've got to jump through ho hoops and you've got to be quicker than they are, right? You've got to be quicker than that. Jeremiah goes on with his message from God in verse 11. He says, has a nation changed its gods, even though there are no gods? But many people have changed their glory for what which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. God is baffled. He literally doesn't understand. There is a history with Jehovah. There is a history with God. He provided. They followed. Everything was great. But now they're following after these idols made of man. These gods that there is no history. There is no proof that they even exist apart from what man has built or erected to him. And God, it says, even the heavens wonder why in the world is israel treating god this way notice the example god is a fountain of water picture that out of the ground clean sweet pure water just bubbling up right that's awesome it's kind of like remember old jed out for a day hunting for some food up from the ground come bubbling crude right oil that is or millions of dollars that is right God provided for them. He said, like a spring coming from the water, all the water you would ever need. But they went and built their own cisterns. You know what a cistern is? So you've got running water over here. A cistern is a man-made object that holds water. Right? It, it doesn't replenish itself. You dig a well. You know, the well, usually you hit a spring or you hit the water that, that filters through the earth, and you have water in the well. Cisterns, we bury in the ground so that we can still have water for our house, but when the cistern runs dry, there's no chance of any water going back into it unless we put it into it. And God is saying, you had springs of living water, and you decided you wanted to build a cistern. It doesn't make sense. I'm a volunteer firefighter. Always been a rural volunteer for a fire volunteer firefighter um when i first got on in illinois there um no fire hydrants out in the country so we had what was called dump tanks so you take tanker trucks fill them up with water you'd go to the scene we'd have two dump tanks on the ground and you would dump the water out of the tanker into the into this swimming pool basically is what it was a portable swimming pool and our truck would draft out of that and we would fight the fire and when you'd run out of water, as soon as he dumped the water, he would go back, find a hydrant or find a place to, to siphon from, fill up the tank, come back, and, and do that. There were those few times that we had a house fire in the city. And that was awesome. Because you know what we did? We dropped a five-inch or a three-inch line, ran it into the truck, and we fought the fire. No sending someone in a truck back and forth. No worrying about is our suction, our hard suction, um, getting water, or did it get some air and cause this whole process to break down? but there was plenty of water to fight the fire. That's the same idea here with cisterns and living water that God is providing. Israel decided, instead of abundant water, instead of everything I need for life, I'm going to go dig my own cistern. Now, some of you might think, oh, well, they're going to take that living water, abundant water that God's given, and they're going to put it in a cistern. So what you're telling me is they don't trust God that his well will never run dry. Or there's another theory. This is a theory I believe is happening with, with Israel. They built a cistern because they wanted to be in control. I want you to understand that. If I have a cistern, if I have a backup water system, I'm not so much worried if the city turns my water off. Why? Because I can go to my cistern and I can pull out the water. See, Sometimes we want to be in control. Notice what he calls these cisterns. They are cracked. In other words, they don't even hold water. See, it's pride that gets in the way of our relationship with God a lot of times. God is providing everything we need. He's providing the future. He's providing the past. He's providing the present. But you don't like it. You, you don't know if you want to trust God, but boy, you sure do trust yourself. 
So you're going to dig a hole, or you're going to build a, a holding tank, and you're going to put all of God's treasures into this holding tank, and you're going to hope that they stay there for when you need them. And God says these cisterns are cracked, and they keep losing water. If I have a cistern that's being cracked and losing water, and I have the opportunity to have water ran to my house so my family is provided for, as a husband, as a dad to kids, what do you think I should do? Probably should tap into the good water source, shouldn't we? But we don't. No, I built this cistern. I don't care if it's cracked and letting water out and my family can't bathe. Uh, there's no water to, to, to eat or to wash fruit or anything like that. I'm going to stick with my cistern because I am in control. That's what Israel's doing. They're hurting their families. They're hurting themselves. Everyone in the nation is hurting. But boy, they're in control. And God all along is saying, I love you. Come back. I love you. Why did you leave? The spring of living water is still there. Now, let's flip over to James. In James chapter 1, I want to jump to the end. We'll be in verse 13 through 18. But, but I want to hit the end, verse 17 through 18. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, within whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here we had the same God acting in the same way toward the church. Man, I'm going to give you every good and perfect thing you need. That, that abundant water, that sweet water, that water that's good for everything you need it for. I want to give it to you, the church. There's no shadow or deceit or hidden agenda in God. He's not saying, oops, you, you got to be quicker than that. He's giving the gifts. They are ours. They're at our disposal. God does not change in his affection toward us. But you see, the gifts, much like the commercial, are a byproduct of the relationship. They're a byproduct of knowing God, of staying close to God. Israel enjoyed their great success when they made God their God, God their king. But when they started looking to other kings, when they started looking to other things, calamity fell on the nation. The imagery here in James is the same as the imagery in Jeremiah. God wanting a relationship with the church. God wanting a relationship with us. I don't know, God. I, I don't know about that. I, I think maybe I can do better. Notice verse 14 of James. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Interesting thing, the word tempted here is the same word we talked about last week when James talks about trials. Now, see, the difference between trials and temptations, even though it's the same word, is the place that this comes from. The word here literally translates pressure. Trials are outside pressure. Temptation is inside pressure. I am tempted when the pressure comes from inside of me to change or to do things. Um, he uses the word lure. Now, that's a pretty good rain right there. Now, where we are as a church and with all these lakes around us, I'm pretty sure we know what lures are, right? Lures are artificial objects made to look like something that a fish would normally eat, right? And we put colors on it and we put, you know, there's spinners on it, there's, there's propellers on sound, all sorts of things. But the idea is we want that fish that is sitting in the water with everything he needs to survive and be happy. We're trying to get that fish to bite at something that is fake. And worse than fake, it's got a hook in it, right? And, and let's say that fish bites that lure. And now we've got him, right? We've got him on the string. Now he moves wherever he wants to go, and, and we're trying to pull against him all the pressure to get him to go where we want him to go. That's the idea here. What happens if we catch a fish, and let's say he gets off before we even get him into our boat or to the shore? Whether we caught that fish or not, the hook has still done its damage. There is a hole in that fish where the hook set in, especially if it has a barb. But you know what? No one makes that fish bite the hook. The fish makes its own choice. 
See, that's what we want to do sometimes is we want to say it's their fault. It's their fault. Can you imagine down in the water, Ralph and Sam are sitting there just swimming away. Life is fun. Do, do, do. Just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. Ralph says to Sam, Sam, I'll bet you can't catch that funny looking shad going through the water. Sam goes, you know I can. Right? Ralph goes, no, you can't. Sam goes, yes, I can. I double dare you. Sam goes up and bites the lure. And whammy! Right? He's either mounted on a wall or he's on someone's plate. Right? Sam still made the choice to bite the lure. Guys, the temptation that comes from inside of us, it is ours. Not my kids, not my pastors, not my, not my wife's, not my co-workers. I can't blame anyone else when I fail except myself. That's the idea. We made the choice. Notice in verse 15. He says, Then when we've given way to that desire, when it is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. James uses some biology here. At least I think it's biology. I wasn't very good or in science when I was in school. It may be chemistry or astrology. I, I don't know. I think it's biology though, right? He says, that idea, that idea, that temptation comes from inside of me. And instead of, instead of getting rid of it, instead of covering it in Bible verses or telling Jesus to get this out of my head, we entertain that thought. As we keep entertaining it, that thought, that thought grows. And eventually, it gives birth to sin. I, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 70s. How many of you guys remember Mork and Mindy? Remember Mork and Mindy? All right, and Mork and Mork's from Mork, all right? Nanu, Nanu comes down, lives with Mindy. Of course, they fall in love, and they get married right, and they do what adults do. And Mork and Mindy have an egg. Because Mork's from Ork, right? And this egg grows, and they give birth to mirth. That's what they call the mirth, right? Combination of mork and earth, mirth. And there's mirth, Jonathan Winters, right? And they give birth to this, to this child, and it's like, why in the world did you give birth to an old person? And Mork says, well, an orc, we believe in and in, in they age backwards. He goes, that way you want to keep the old people around you more and more instead of shipping them off to a home. Well, it's kind of the same idea with sin, right? It grows, it grows, and, and we get used to it. And once we've lived with sin for a while, boy, man, we don't want to let it go. But let's get back to mirth for a minute. How many of you women would like to give what we think is a natural childbirth to mirth. <laughs> Ain't happening, is it? How many women would want to have kids if out came a six foot two, two hundred and fifty plus pound, wrinkly, hairy adult? We wouldn't want to do it. But see, sin is like that. We, we entertain those thoughts. We then start marrying it with a plan and an action. And before you know it, we're stuck with sin. One of the ways that we try and teach our kids to stay away from sin, to stay away from drugs and alcohol and, and, and all that stuff that can take you down a wrong road, you know, just like commercials, they figured it out. If I show you a picture of a, of a meth head who is hooked on meth, you're not going to want to go there, right? No teeth, skin's all messed up. Literally, their life is falling apart. Their art organs are failing. Hopefully, our kids see that and say they don't want it. I'm here to tell you, if God wanted to keep people away from having premarital sex, having babies like that might stop people. If you had a kid outside of marriage, if they came out like mirth, everyone would wait until they're married to have a kid, I'll bet. Understanding sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to trouble so let's make a deal all right amber watch that that show let's make a deal some of you remember the old guy right what was his name hall that's right monty hall and then you've got the new guy if you're younger what's his name guys wayne brady 
So you've got Monty Hall and Wayne Brady, but both of them had that word zonk, right? And what was the idea of let's make a deal? Is they would put something in your hand, right? Whether it was an envelope or, or whether it was even a box. <coughs> and they would say, would you trade what you have for this? And they wouldn't show you. Or sometimes they would show you. And you'd have to decide, man, is what I have, even though I can't see it, is it better than what I see? But there was always looming that zonk, right? And basically what zonk meant is nothing. You didn't get anything. We have a loving Father who says, I will give you springs of living water. I will give you everything you need. Or you have the promise, maybe there's something better. What are we going to choose? Trials, tribulations, they will come to us because we live in a fallen world. Those are pressures that heap on us from the outside. But temptations, the temptation to walk away from God, the temptation to walk away from what is good, that comes from within us. That is a choice that we make. So how do we overcome temptation? It's all about focus. It's all about focus. Focus on Jesus Christ and what is good. When I'm sitting at home, and yesterday there was a great uh, thing happening on TV. Two channels were running John Wayne movies. So I either sat in my chair after, after doing some work in the morning, I went out in the garage and worked on some, some uh, gun stocks I'm redoing, and I was able to watch John Wayne for two or three hours, well, more than that, if, if I'm honest. I might have been doing a little bit of work here and there, but I was still listening and watching John Wayne. You know, when I'm sitting there watching John Wayne and my kids are over there making pipe bombs, setting fires to the drapes. I don't know. Unless the fire gets on me or the sprinkler hits me, I don't know what's going on. Why? Because I'm focused in on, on, on the movie, on John Wayne. I mean, they were good ones. Rio Bravo, Sons of, of Katie Elder. I mean, just some great, oh, McClintock. I can't forget McClintock. Where's the whiskey? Oh, I love that part. And they all had that fight and slide down the mudslide. Sounds like the kids might have a mudslide at their work day today too, maybe. Man, just, I'm focused on it. Or maybe you're driving down the road, and someone's up alongside of you, and finally your kids so, say, hey, that's so-and-so next to you as they're honking the horn trying to get your attention. Hi. I mean, and then you finally catch up to them, and they say, you know, I was following you, or I was alongside of you for miles, and you just weren't paying attention. Well, of course not. I was focused on the road and where I was going. That's what a good driver does. Or I was texting, and you just couldn't see my eyes down here. It's all about our focus. Jesus is to be our target. Jesus is our example. We need to focus on him. Focus. If we don't focus our minds and our lives and our hearts on Jesus, we're going to wander. Jesus' promise isn't that things are always going to be easy, but his promise is we will never be alone. Next screen. Matthew 28, 20. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. His promise is that all of this will have a purpose. We know that God works all things together for good. Last week, our trials, God will bring a purpose out of those exterior pressures that come on us if we just trust him. His promise is that all will be good in the end, and his promise is an inheritance incorruptible that won't fade away, will be reserved in eternity for us. Guys, that's the focus we need to have to make it through temptation. Ah, oh, but if you, if you just veer over here, you know, Wendy's has 99-cent Frosties. Dad, can we stop? Oh, we got to get here, though. We got to be here by a certain time. Oh, but the Frosties, Dad. The temptations are always there. Do we focus on Jesus? Jesus is the one we're to focus on. Notice Hebrews chapter 12. I know all these words aren't up there, but I'm going to read you verses 1 through 3. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured for sinners such hostility against himself so that you might not grow weary or faint-hearted. The same power that was in Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I am leaving 
because that Holy Spirit can't come if I'm still here. That same power that Jesus had, he's given to us. Well, I don't know how to live. Focus on Jesus. Well, how do you know about Jesus? I get into his word because that's where God has uh, decided to reveal himself to us. Are you in God's word? You can't be focused on Jesus if you're not in his word. Yeah, but I sure pray a lot. That's you talking to God. Are you hearing God talking to you? Is your focus on Jesus? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Some of us face sin and face trials because we've just refused to grow up in the Lord. We've stayed where we are. Oh, I'm not going to hell. Life is good. There's so much more to this life in Christ than not going to hell, people. There's an eternity we're going to have growing and serving and enjoying the fellowship of God. Satan dangles out empty promises. Oh, I got you a dollar. I'm here to tell you a dollar in light of eternity is nothing. A dollar in light of the riches that Jesus Christ has in store for those that love him is nothing. Where is our focus? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we look at your word, the thing that comes to mind is Satan is always counterfeiting what you have made great. Satan is always trying to give us options uh, to the things that you have made best. And like David said, we are prone to wander. We're prone to do what we want to do. All we like sheep, we've gone our own way. But you never fail. Your love is still there. And the spring of life, that, that relationship with you, you don't go anywhere. We're the prodigals. We're the ones that have walked away. We're the ones that have bit. We're the ones that have taken the deal. Instead of enjoying fellowship with you, we've decided that somehow we can make it better by stepping outside of the boundaries that you've given us. Father, please forgive us. Forgive us as a church. Forgive me as an individual. God, forgive us as a nation as we have pushed you to the corners of our society. One day, we know that all of us will bow and confess that you are Lord. God, I pray for those of us sitting here that we make you Lord of our lives today. I pray as a church, as Keith Baptist Church, our community knows that we make much of Jesus Christ. I thank you that there's forgiveness when we give in. That you're still waiting there, waiting for the prodigals to come home. Thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your provision of amazing gifts that we don't deserve. In your name we pray. Amen. I don't know.